Well, thanks very much, and um, what a morning. Wasn't it amazing to lunchtime? And um, I think, you know, Paddy, you know, you've, you've really done us proud. Um, and I agree uh, with Ron, you know, I certainly want to join as well. I mean, it's uh, some energy here and things need to be done. And I think there's a lot that can be done with the sort of people in this room and uh, moving this further forward. So thank you for the invitation. Um, what I've been doing this week uh, hasn't just been sitting at home. Um, and uh, on Tuesday, I actually went to the World Congress of Public Health Medicine. And that's where the diet thing came up. So that's one of the reasons for my question earlier this morning. And I was in Albury yesterday. Um, and in Albury, I was asked to go and speak because of all people, well, of all people, I suppose, the Royal Australian College of Practice, uh, of Obstetrics and Gynecologists had a side meeting about <coughs> the health, the mental health, and suicidality amongst the medical profession because of a recent case they had in, in New South Wales of an obstetrician that had taken her life. Um, and that goes along a whole lot of other work that's been going on the last few weeks um, about suicidality amongst our profession uh, in New South Wales again. Uh, up until um, uh, <coughs> Australia Day, they had four. And in Victoria, we had four in a very short length of time prior to that. So um, I've been playing in this space in various guys and various roles along the, along the way. Um, and it's, it's certainly something that's a, a tragic place to, that we're in, and I think there's a whole lot we need to do. And this compliance piece is one part of it. It's not the whole part of it. Mental health might be part of it, but it's not all part of it. There's an awful lot of things that are going on in this space. Um, and so for me, it's really a, an opportunity to bring together some of those themes. What's really interesting, and I'm sure it's the same for everyone else who spoke today, that we haven't actually spoken to each other, the people here who've put together presentations. And many of the words are the same. Yeah. Many of the themes are the same. Um, and many of the big pieces of pain are the same. And I just want to give you my, my perspective from a slightly different point of view. Um, and, you know, at the outset I'd like to say, and I'm sure everyone would agree with me, that, you know, if somebody's doing the wrong thing, that doesn't help anybody. It doesn't help me, it doesn't help my patients, it doesn't help the community. Um, and that's not what this is about. And if somebody is in a dangerous place, then that's not a good thing either. Um, if they're unwell, they have the right to get well and then go back to normal. If they're unwell, it's quite reasonable not to be in the workplace, but that, that has to be done, and if not fit to practice. But this is something that came out of your, 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 your quotes, Maxine, you know, that we should not be subjugated from our normal human rights just because we've got a medical degree, which often happens. Um, you know, right, right to take away, and that's not right. Um, and, you know, the fundamental thing about us is that we've taken this oath, if you like, through some way or another, whether it's the Hippocratic Oath or it's the Geneva Convention of Geneva, that's the AMA, WMA's uh, piece of work, uh, is to look after people. And fundamentally, that's what we're all about. And I like, I like what you said about the fact that, and I know you sit there thinking, how can I go and damage somebody today? That's not, that's not what it's all about. Um, and so to me, the compliance piece is you know, quite broad. And there are so many levels of compliance we have to put up with in our lives when we decide to go into the medical profession. Uh, and this starts even before selection. Um, and I get more and more tired and upset about some of the social engineering that happens out there, and people saying, what's the right selection criteria for a doctor? I mean, I don't know about you, but when I went in, we were a hodgepodge of different people um, who moulded and grew in our skills from very different <laughs> backgrounds with a very common, good clinical knowledge. But we practised our craft in different ways, and people migrate to the sorts of practitioner and style that they like. And you don't have to have a bog standard vanilla doctor because um, you know, that doesn't work because there are different needs for different people. And of course, uh, as a student now, students are registered by our friends at Upright. Um, and that's brought along its own challenges along the way because, as you know, going through student days, people have their difficulties. But here are young people, you know, my son, for God's sake, and he's, you know, he's still my son, he's, he's an adult now. But the th sorts of things, if he, if, if he and other of his cohort were assaulted with the same sorts of things we've heard about today, which they are, and I've sat there and helped them, and I've brought people into the tent to help them to get out of that, that mess, uh, how is a young person that age supposed to put up with that? Uh, universities have their own challenges, if you want to put that, how to make people run and so on. And of course, once you get out to the workplace, uh, there are multiple things that happen in the hospital sector uh, in terms of uh, uh, occupational health and safety work, hours of work, 
uh, and, and those processes, you've got to not buck the trend, otherwise you don't get on. And that's part of the conversation we've had today, that if you, if you don't conform, uh, all of a sudden you're, you're put into a, in a, into a, a box and you're seen as being a problem. Um, and, you know, some of the things around bullying and harassment and remediation processes are there. But what does that actually mean? So one of the things we actually talked about, and if you are, are uh, on the internet, you don't have to be on Twitter, and you looked at my Twitter from yesterday, and you just got to put my, my Twitter, which will come in a minute, um, you'll see some of the conversations we had. We actually put role-played some of these things. And often what's said in the way in which it's said is as powerful <coughs> as hurtful as if it wasn't said at all or said in a different way. And this, this notion about having uh, uh, some, some, some EQ, some emotional quotient about what's being said and how you're saying it, because it makes a big difference uh, to what's actually going on. And then, of course, in the workforce, uh, w workplace, there are so many things working as a doctor, as a health professional, uh, as, as someone in, in emergency services, that is really confronting. And we don't actually have an opportunity to debrief about that, because that's what we're seen as being, well, big boys don't cry. That's not me. You don't have to worry about that. Why not? You're human. Mm -hmm. Why haven't we got, and this came up in one of the slides earlier today, some kind of mentoring that actually is there to help us through this process? Because we need that sort of debriefing. It's actually okay. When I was um, president of the AMA, um, at a barbecue, out of the blue, somebody said to me, GP, didn't even know him from, from Bar Soap, said, so how do you tell people what you do? How, how do you debrief from all that multiple layers of interaction you have? And I said, just do it, you know. He said, no, no, you need to go off and debrief with someone. So on that advice, I actually took up and saw a psychologist once a month, just for me, no Medicare, no private health insurance, just that because you need to do that. And, you know, that, there's no shame in that. There's no shame in seeing a psychiatrist. One of the things that was the person that was guiding the so uh, session last week was talking about you seeing a psychiatrist and they think that's the bottom of the, of the, the, the bottom of the pub. It's not true. If you need help, if you break your leg, you're going to go and see an orthopedic surgeon. Mm. Well, maybe you would. Would you? Yeah. <laughs> you know you would. Um, and it's the same with this. And in litigation, and this is the thing I, I like when one of those slides there, you know, Machiavelli was absolutely right. You know, those who are going to benefit from the system will be the last ones to want to see it change. And I hate to say that sometimes the Treasury managed funds that look after some people in the hospital sector may not have your best interest at heart because they're looking at the big system and the fiscal uh, dollar rather than your own reputation. And I think we've got to hold our medical defence organisations to that same standard, even if they're the ones of last resort. And of course, we have to maintain our, our health. Um, and then as we move out of the training system into our own practices, there's a whole, a whole layer of compliance with local government, state governments. Um, and one I'm going to talk about a bit later on in a bit more detail uh, is Medicare and the primary, the professional services review process, which if you think that APRA is tough, they're like teddy bears compared to the people there, if you ask me. Um, and to me, it's really problematic. Uh, same methodology, but a different, different set of guidelines. And of course, there's always the interpersonal relationships. You know, we're people, we're in, work, we're in the workplace, wherever you are, it's a challenge. How do we deal with people? How do we know how, who to go to to get some help? Who can we who can call time out and help us through those, those various places? Because this goes on through the whole place. And one of the saddest things is blaming the victim. Um, when I spoke about, you know, the, 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 this, the, this young woman that died in Sydney, uh, she was a trainee in, as a physician, and she's in the public space. Her family have come out in the Telegraph the last three weeks and said, what's happened to her? And really, do people talk about suicidality? Really, the family asked because of this. it seen as a difficult thing to do. But they've been a very brave family. Um, and, and this is something that people start saying, well, were they cut out for medicine? Excuse me? What does that mean? This lady actually used to swim for Australia. Uh, she was a, a trained podiatrist and wanted to do something else. Why are you saying there's no resilience? Why are you <coughs> saying that, that blaming the victim? We've got to avoid that at all costs. We've heard a bit about our friends at, at, at APRA. Um, and this is the, their, their whole um, process is there in their little fold-out uh, um, uh, pamphlet there. Um, and, you know, I, I think that it's important to understand that um, they are part of a process and there are ways that this has to change. And we're hearing a lot about this now. There's some great ideas coming here, and I think the challenge is to get that into a format that we can pass it back to the organisation and actually challenge them about it, 
but we've actually got to use those political processes as well and go with other people as well, form a coalition uh, and work with other peaks and other people that can actually make a change, make, a di make some direction in this space. Um, I was speaking to Paddy the other day and he's saying, I'm just about to go into the, the, um, the last session of the, uh, the um, uh, regulation uh, inquiry, service inquiry last, this week, wasn't it, Paddy? Early this week, early last week. And um, so that's ended. I don't think, you know, if there's some good things that come out of this, there's no reason why we couldn't chuck something back into there. And we certainly have the, uh, the ear of some of the senators there. And I think that's an important thing to do. Um, and, you know, there's been so many of these inquiries. Um, the important thing is to get some change about it. There's no point having an inquiry if we don't have any change coming out of that. Um, so, you know, litigation is becoming harder. And this is a point I've made. You know, we, we, we pointed this out that with the law of tort changing across the country, uh, and tort law reform, it's becoming more and more difficult to access general, general damages and to sue. So there's more people going through these other regulatory processes. Um, the vexatious claim thing is there. It's being used as a, as a, as a commercial tool, which is really, really, really problematic. Um, and, you know, the multiple bites of the, of, a different, of the cherry by the same person with different layers of uh, different times trying to get the same person for whatever it is that they're doing. And we know that the law came in, and, and there's some things that have been, been uh, the, the COAG Health Council has spelled out some things about the APRA law and has going to be changed, including bringing the, uh, the um, uh, paramedics, but also about the changes to the, where the chair, chairpersons might be appointed. I'm not sure this is a great thing. Um, and also some of the ways that people are working in this area. But the, there is a recognition that things have to change, how that's going to work. We can drive. We should drive. We shouldn't be waiting for others. We should be making those changes. In the Medicare space, Medicare compliance was done by Medicare. That was used to be owned by the Department of Health. That was taken over and given to Department of Human Services in 2004. It's just come back to health. And the problem previously was, if you were going through any of those compliance processes through Medicare, and say there's a problem, health would say, oh, that's a Medicare problem. And Medicare would say, that's a health problem. Um, and what's happened is the, the compliance piece has been taken back to health, which might bring some more, some more, some more clarity. And on the health website about compliance with Medicare, they've got some new literature which is you know, much the same that's going on. <coughs> the, personal, the professional services review piece was reviewed. There's also been seven inquiries about this one. And um, uh, people who may or may not have been part of that or seen there, uh, I, I would mention a colleague of ours who also died along the way, not at his own hand, luckily, but he was uh, seen by the professional services review, appealed the processes, won, and for his, for his, for his uh, efforts, he was put back to another commit, committee of review. And this happened twice under the federal courts. And on the third time, he said, I'm not doing this anymore, I'm going to the, the high court. And unfortunately, he died on the way to the high court. So unfortunately, he didn't get his time in court. Um, but you know, in, in, in this process, you're going through a Medicaid uh, re review interview. You're then referred on to the Director of Professional Service Review. Uh, and then you go through this awful process of a committee of peers. And we've heard all about that peer review first thing this morning. And I think it's very relevant, and the words there are really, really bite. For me, the professional service review system is appalling. I had to sit there through eight days of a hearing fairly recently. The words of the medical defence organisation, the words of the medical defence organisation are, nobody wins. What kind of system can that be? If you are actually right and you can't win. I mean, that's terrible. Um, and we're subjected to this whole paralegal judicial process where they have complete power. They can ask you, you, you may go for one thing, they can ask you about anything and everything that they want. And if you don't comply, you can go through the whole process of being fined and so on. Um, and so it's a really problematic process. Um, and the end game is already predetermined before you go to these things. Um, and you've really got to fight hard to make a change um, and, and, and really fight in, in this place because uh, they are not subject, they are not my peers, they're not your peers. They're really people um, that are uh, uh, trained and briefed by lawyers. And the methodology is a star chamber where basically if you're sitting there, um, they, can, uh, they, they can ask you any question and you are obliged to answer it. And often it comes down to the notes weren't good enough after lots and lots of this, these things. So it's, it's a really problematic way. So people are forced to take a settlement because they know the alternatives are worse. Uh, in this situation, I know of one woman who uh, was supposed to be doing too many mental health care plans. In this place where you can't get mental health care, you're doing too many mental health care plans. And if you go back 
and you want you want to be fined. If you don't do any more of these, you, you're fined or your your penalty is a certain amount. But if you decide to do them, we'll double up your penalty. And so it's it's you know we, what they say. You know what the price is. You know what we're talking about. Um, and you know the situation of settlements. And it's a derogatory set of requirements, and they're really problematic. And of course, we've got the potential revalidation coming. So I could go on at infinitum about these things, but they are costing us as individuals, they're costing our insurer, um, and they're costing us in our livelihoods and in our reputations and the way in which we do things. I've got a, 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 a way of describing the spirometry. I won't go there. But suffice to say, if you do the right thing, by using best practice, best evidence, best patient outcomes, because most of your peers don't do that, most GPs don't do uh, spirometries, even in Melbourne where we've had um, the recent uh, asthma crisis, um, because you're doing the right thing, you're actually clipped because your peers don't do it. Because the test is not what's the right medicine, it's what your peers are doing, and that's, it's a joke. That's a joke. Uh, and so this is the last thing. We did this thing yesterday about, uh, uh, about addressing suicide. This is the net process, net edge of this process. We're not watching it. It's the worst thing that can possibly happen. We don't want to go there. But unfortunately, all these things are masked at this. People in this room have been incredibly brave for standing out and talking up. And I see this time and time again. And we need to be out there to support them. People need to get your backs. People need to get my backs. We need to get each other's backs. Because this process is intimidating. And people feel stained and they shouldn't be doing that and feel ashamed. They should not be. There should be a way of remediation in this whole process and making us feel a bit, a bit better. The way forward, I can't give you an answer. Uh, well, we've got some great thoughts coming out of here. Thank you very much. Thank you.